All right, many thanks, Dennis Temple, for that background report. Uh, let's now get into the conversation now. Uh, we have uh, with us uh, seated uh, to review the 2024 Hajj, Jalal Ahmed Arabi, uh, the chairman, CEO, Nakon. Many thanks for joining us, sir. Very many thanks to you. Thank you very much indeed, and good morning, Nigerian. All right. Um, just give us an overview of... Um, the 2024 Hajj, how did it go from preparation to airlifting to the Hajj proper, managing the pilgrims and the return journey? How did it go? Well, I hope I won't be accused of blowing my trumpet, <laughs> but um, with all sense of modesty and responsibility, <coughs> I'll say that it's been a success. Mm. Now, let me take us back a bit. When I assumed in October, preparations for 2024 Hajj had commenced. You would recall that sometime in August, September, there was an announcement of a Hajj fair, which was meant to be a deposit of about 4.5, 4.9. Now, the tradition has always been Hajj has received special attention from government when it comes to an exchange rate. There have been concessionary rates in the past that have been given to pilgrims. And I know that that wasn't restricted probably to uh, the Muslim pilgrims. But then, because of changes in policy, both monetary and fiscal, 2024 became special. You would recall that government in its wisdom came up with a policy that allowed the Naira to float. So it became near impossible for any window of concession to be granted. Pilgrims started the deposits, but it was rather coming slowly. Now the pattern has always been, whatever the pilgrims come to deposit in the states, with the state's pilgrims welfare boards, such amounts are remitted to the NACON account in CBN. These accounts is normally controlled by NACON, but the money is in there are harvested on behalf of the pilgrims and on behalf of the states. These are the same monies that are used to buy the services. When I say buying the services, of course, you talk about the accommodation, the feeding, and the transportation in Saudi Arabia. These are the funds that you use to pay the providers. Let me make an explanation and advisedly. Probably it would answer maybe any forthcoming question that you will ask. That has become necessary because the Saudi policy recognizes only NACON as an entity, just like it recognizes NACON sister agencies all over the world. In other words, it doesn't deal with fragmented uh, entities. It deals with one entity. Fast forward. So when we have vest these monies, that are sent by the states, we then pay the providers that one, for example, arrangements in Mecca, both the accommodation and the feeding, are normally the prerogative of the states. They choose those to provide services to them. What we do is we make sure that they tick all the boxes in terms of comfort, in terms of how conducive both the accommodation and the feeding will be, and we tick on that. But then, you recall that getting the deposit into the NACONS account in CBN became an issue. Initially, there was the hope there was going to be a concession, which was a tradition. It never occurred. So we were foot dragging. At a point, we were almost giving up. 
that probably 2024 Heights was going to be a mirage. Now, consultations went on, but at a point we had to now approach the federal government and indeed the states to say that the way things are going, unless we get a concessionary rate to cushion the effect of whatever the pilgrims are expected to pay, there's going to be a problem. And of course, Nigerians would recall that it was at that point that the president magnanimously granted 90 billion naira to subsidize whatever that was going to be paid. Now, let me define that too. <clears throat> People will ask why 90 billion if there was no concession. It might interest Nigerians to know that whenever you talk about high fare, you are talking about dollar denominated service. It's paid in dollars. So whatever computation you make is based on what your Naira can purchase to the level of the dollar that you would want. Now, initially, when we came up with the calculations, realizing that 4.5, 4.9 wasn't going to fly, we said, okay, if you try to convert 5,692 or thereabout to a Naira at an exchange rate for that day, which was going to 1,500 to a dollar, you're taking about over 8 million, 8.5 million. How do you get 8.5 million when it was even difficult to get 4.5, 4.9? Now, we thought of so many things. What do you do? If you recall, at a point, we just had to buy the bullet. We came up with the pronouncement that, look, reality has set in. Hatch fare is over 8 million. It's close to 9 million. And there's a problem. People that are struggling to pay 4.5, 4.9. How did they pay 9? <laughs> so when the concession wasn't coming in, that was when the president gave 90 billion. Now with the president's 90 billion, at a point in time, we had barely 18,000 pilgrims that could have been taken care of with the 90 billion. Assuming that you've translated and changed the 5.6, 5,692 into Naira with an exchange rate of about 1.5, okay, if you spread the 90 billion, it could cover 18,000 or thereabout. But there you are. By the figures, at that time you already had close to 50,000 pilgrims that had registered. Who do you sideline? Who do you excise from the well-intentioned activities that were going on? So after due consultation, I know it. whatever we did with the 90 billion, government was aware, we got all stakeholders to be aware of what was happening. It was then agreed that, look, why don't you spread the 90 billion across the close to 50,000 so that everybody will have a feel of the magnanimity. It was then the calculation came up that, look, if you're spreading it of the 90 billion to these individuals, then everybody will get 1,630-something. But there's still a gap for you to get to that threshold I told you, which invariably means that there's still a shortfall of 1.918 million or thereabout. I'm sure you will recall, and Nigerians will too, that it was at that stage that some of the subnationals really stood up to come and assist. Some governors gave in their own contribution in mitigating the hardship. Some gave a million and said, look, okay, you pilgrims, go and look for 918. Some gave 1.5 million. Some, get, some gave the 918 million, and so on and so forth. But Allah has always been kind. And if he has called you, you are destined to go. There will always be a way. 
quite a good number of those that had paid the 4.5.9 rose to the occasion. They were able to get the 1.9 million because, you know, because of the time gap that we got, most of them that were peasants were able to sell their farm produce, some sell their animals because they were lucky that the period was apt for them to do that since there was an extension per se and they did and there we were now that is for the fair then came the issue of the visa because we realized that there were two major factors that either caused delay or mar the entire Hajj arrangement when you consider the processes one is the visa issuance. You discover that there is delay in issuance of visa. And unfortunately, these visas are not maybe a one-off thing that you stay within the comfort of your office. You just take a stamp, stamp on people's passport and say, okay, you've gotten the visa, go. There are some conditions precedence before you're issued a visa. Part of it is you have to show that you have paid for the pilgrim on a certain portal You've secured accommodation for him. You've secured somebody that will feed him. You've secured his transportation. All these components will now give the grinder that, well, okay, yes. Victor is good to go. Or Irene is good to go. Yes, issue her visa or issue him visa. Unless you do that, no visa for you. So in the past, there were these challenges that visas are delayed. You don't get them on time. Sometimes you go begging for an extension to do that. We now say, okay, why don't we address that so that we can have some concentration on the other sectors? So we did, and God helping us, we were able to succeed on that. We made sure that we address the issue of the visa on time, make sure that we shut that door so that we can straight on the other factor that mitigates this. The second factor is the air flight you discover that pilgrims will be ready the visas will be there but there are no aircraft they don't come some would say that it was they have the facility they have the capacity to do it and then you come and the jets are not there so but this time around but this time around we say no we did so having concluded on the visa issue we now concentrated on the air air freight and that one too god help us for the first time in so many years we didn't have to ask the authority to beg the Saudis to extend the opening of the airspace for us or to say that please we want to land but we want the more time to do that no three days before they closed their airspace we had carried all our pilgrims to saudi arabia and everybody had some had, uh, it, it was clearly a winding, um, long and tortuous 2024 Hajj. Well, we'll put you on hold while we introduce you. Ray, you have uh, our guest. Oh, yeah. yes, uh, we have Ustaz Abu Bakr Sadiq uh, Mohammed, an Islamic scholar with the National Mosque, a private Hajj operator, and managing director of Comoral Travels and Tours Limited. Many thanks for joining us, Ustaz Abu Bakr. Thank you for having me. All right. Uh, so um, I agree with my chairman. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sheikh. Welcome. Thank you, All sir. right. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to ask were you part of the pilgrims for 2024 Hajj? I was part of the organizers. You were part of the organizers. I'm more than the pilgrim. Okay. <laughs> so at least you were there. You were there. So you could understand was... everything that happened. Yes. So, you know, uh, uh, Jalal Ahmad Arabi, the chairman of Nakan, has, you know, tried to, you know, put us in the picture of what happened, you know, uh, for this year's Hajj. I like you. Uh, you know, to speak about some issues that have been raised. Uh, you know, what is raising concerns in some quarters at the moment is a 90 billion which the federal government um, gave to subsidize uh, this year's Hajj. Uh, some have said um, for a government that is removing subsidy on fuel, electricity and all of that, subsidizing Hajj is not the right step to go. I'd like you to speak concerning that. Um, if you think that it was um, the need for 
you know, that had to be done. And then speak to us about how it was shared because there are also comments in, in some quarters that some people got more, others got less, some were more comfortable during the Hajj, others were treated badly, others didn't get good food. Speak around these issues. Uh, Hajj is uh, a pillar of uh, our religion. Uh, it is not what uh, the Muslim community thought that uh, it should be uh, for a share of any largesse from the government. Whether anything comes from the government or not, there will be Hajj and people will still go to Hajj. About the 90 billion and how it was distributed, I think the chairman has uh, shed light uh, on that. Uh, they are the authorities of Hajj and they have distributed in ways that uh, they have seen best. Uh, our only complaint as uh, tour operators is that we are also Nigerians, our pilgrims are Nigerians. We should have uh, given uh, a share of that cake uh, that, that came from the government. Uh, in its wisdom, the commission thought that uh, we are serving higher clientele uh, that are people of means that do not need any help from the government to perform uh, the Hajj. Uh, that is an opinion. You don't uh, seem to agree with that. No, we don't. Actually, we don't. The government should subsidize the rich. We are all Nigerians. We are all Nigerians. Uh, on a more serious note, uh, the Hajj uh, went well, but with uh, uh, the issue that he started mentioning before you stopped him, uh, the issue of uh, issuance of visa, uh, many of the pilgrims, because the, the laws changed, uh, of the Saudi authorities. We were used to uh, issuing our visas on the detents. And from there, you upgrade to the A10 services. Uh, everybody did that, especially with the deadline of closure of issuance of visas on the 29th of April. Mm. You wouldn't want the date to meet you and your pilgrims are not issued visas. So everybody used what was available at, on the platform then and issued their visas uh, for their pilgrims on the 10th A. Arriving in Saudi Arabia, we now heard that there was no more upgrade to another tent, that the spaces in the, in the Mashai, that is the Mina and Arafah, are allotted according to uh, the, the, the package on the visa. So once your visa is, is D, and that is the area that the Hajj Commission uh, mainly uh, controls. Almost all the pilgrims are on the D uh, packages. Uh, so they said nobody would upgrade. And that created a lot of uh, issues. A lot of issues because uh, our pilgrims are not for the D tents. They are for the A tents. So that, 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 that made... Uh, uh, people to go into into serious uh, problem. Uh, the chairman is quite aware uh, of that. He has he has been involved in all the problems that uh, we faced, uh, as far as the eight tents uh, are concerned, uh, during uh, the Hajj. He went extra uh, mile. I mean, I called, I disturbed, I complained. I was almost weeping, because uh, there was no solution. The Hajj ministry has said it and is on the system and you cannot change it. Uh, the, the Hajj Commission has control over the tents as they say in the Hajj Ministry that the Hajj Commission can do and undo. But apparently the, the, the control of uh, the, 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 the position of pilgrims in the Mashair is with the Hajj Ministry. So we, 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 we went into, into, into serious uh, issues there until uh, uh, almost everybody gave up. So when we came to Medina, this was barely a few days to even going out to the Mashair. There was no solution. The last telephone call I had with the chairman, we, we spoke directly, I knew that there was no hope. So we gathered our pilgrims and we informed them, look, this is what is happening. Now, not many of us would be able to face the pilgrims and tell them, look, we have found ourselves into a problem and we needed uh, a solution. 
Uh, so the pilgrims, of course, would not take it lightly. That was how we continued uh, until a solution was, was, was found. Two days to go into the Mashair. And that solution could only accommodate 192 pilgrims. We were deeply involved. The commission made us to, uh, together with the Itral Khair uh, service providers in Mecca, to, to organize eight tents for those uh, pilgrims. Uh, that was just a drop in the ocean. So the, the, the problems in Mashair uh, and, and the commission, as, as I said earlier, uh, mainly deals with the detent. I will, I will, I will have something to say on the detents. So the the a tents, you have heard a lot of issues. People are have said a lot regarding the a tents issue, but it was a uh, 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 convergence of a lot of problems. Not everybody, as I said earlier could face the pilgrims and said, look, we have a problem. So you have paid for a higher tent. I am not able to get payment for that higher tent. Not that the companies were trying to be mischievous. No. But they could not tell the pilgrims the right thing. So you have paid for a tent. The ministry is saying you cannot take anybody from, from D because your visas are issued with, with the D tents to A. So they brought pilgrims who are not registered, who have not paid for A to stay in A. There must be chaos. So that was what compounded the issue of, uh, of uh, the eight. I think the, the, the... Would you say there's politics in Hajj now? No, I, I don't think it is politics. But uh, in their wisdom, the Saudi authorities are trying to make Hajj as simple as possible. But every time they tried... Uh, uh, a system and it has problems, they would go back to the drawing board and make some amendments. They need to do that uh, on, on this issue of uh, detents and upgrade and, fi and, and uh, transfixing as it were a pilgrim on a particular spot and that pilgrim cannot move to another. And somehow, in spite of the post-mortem they do every year, they mm. haven't managed to get it completely right. No, they are they trying their best. They haven't got a formula mm. that works, that they can do, you know, use year in, year out. But it, it's okay, we'll leave it there for now. Mm. But let me get back uh, to the chairman of NACON. Um, it's a lot of chaos, a lot of crisis, a lot of trouble. And Iero was asking earlier, why, for instance, and I'm, I'm not saying this for NACON alone, even for the Christian Pilgrims Welfare Board, which you may not be in a position to answer for, but just to say that it's a blanket uh, remark uh, question that I'm asking. Why can't government just allow people who want to perform Hajj, who want to perform pilgrimage, who have the means to do so, to just go on their own and you know, make their way to it and deal with it as they can. Because the, I'm looking at the cost that goes into it. I'm looking at the trouble that goes into it. And even after all said and done, it is still not smooth. You find a lot of pilgrims complaining bitterly. Why? Well, you see, Victor, let me sound slightly philosophical. Every spiritual journey, not only Hajj, any spiritual journey that you embark on, trying to get the favor of your Creator, has its own peculiar problems. I'm just laying a foundation on that, so that what I come with subsequently, you will appreciate the foundation I've laid. You can't, as a government, abdicate your responsibilities just because you feel issues of Hajj in particular are private endeavors that individuals should take care of themselves. Particularly because times are hard. No, I know. I know. But you see, in fact, that, that, that makes it even more imperative for government to be concerned about it. If it is a government for the people that cares for the people, I don't know, I don't want to go deep into law, but of course you know chapter 2, the fundamental rights. 
I mean, responsibilities of what government is supposed to do. Now, in whatever you arrange or in whatever you side line yourself to what your citizens do, there has to be control and there has to be regulation. We are in a society of human beings, so you should be able to guide and guard what happens, especially of people that you govern. Yes, it is true, and I'm glad the Sheikh had said it. There is still a window, and there are still those that go through the private operators, respected and recognized ones, such as the one he pilots. But you again have to look at the other side of the coin. You are visiting another entity. And the entity has the final say. In this case, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Now, if they have their policies and you really want to visit there, then you have to be guided by their policies. All right, talking about being guided by their policies, let's look at some of the uh, issues that sprung up. Uh, having a pregnant woman in Saudi Arabia, having a baby preterm. And of course, uh, some people, by the way, how many Nigerians lost their lives in the course of this uh, year's Hajj? Uh, close to 30. Close to 30. And uh, we hear that uh, some of those cases uh, could have been prevented. Speak to us about that. Uh, could be prevented how? Mm -hmm. yeah. We want to hear from you because that's the comment, uh, you know, in public domain. For example, that of the pregnant woman couldn't have, uh, she's not supposed to make that trip. So how does she get uh, on board uh, as one of the pilgrims, uh, you know, with uh, a pregnancy more than 30 weeks? Which, of course, it's obvious, uh, you know, to anyone, uh, of, of course, and it's, it's not part of the regulations, you know, you're not supposed to travel uh, in that condition. So, all of that. And then uh, some who have uh, health challenges, who made it on the trip and eventually passed on. Okay, le le let me start with the last one first. There are things that are beyond your control. You can't stop people from dying if it's their time to die. Um, now that answers that one. Now the second one, the issue of the pregnant pilgrim and those with underlying illnesses. That is a point. That is really something that was disturbing. As a matter of fact, one of the things and the key things that we tell the state's pilgrims welfare boards is to make sure that they advert their minds to what the Saudis frown at, which again is, is obvious. Even if they don't frown at it, there are things that common sense dictates that you look at before then. This is a journey that is very rigorous, that even those with the best of health condition sometimes struggle. But then there are limitations, but with what had happened, having learned our lessons, we will expand the horizon in the screen of pilgrims, even from the state level. But the system has always been, they screen their pilgrims because we give them the guidelines. And then there are some measures that have been introduced in the past where any infraction of these guidelines attracts some punitive actions, like you reduce the slots of any state that has violated some of these guidelines. Example, the issue of allowing pregnant women to go when you know that it's clearly against the guidelines or people with underlining. Uh, and of course, it's something we'll address now going forward. Do they want us to rescreen after they rescreen because it's something more of concern to us. As far as the Saudi government is concerned, they recognize only Nakon as the umbrella. So if there's any infraction from any of the subnationals or any of the private tour operators, they hammer Nakon because they feel that they ought to have titrated all whatever before they go. So like I said, going forward, and we've always said, each Hajj has its own peculiarity and challenges. You can't be perfect. There's only one perfect entity, and that is the Creator. So we learn by the day. With what we have achieved now, we'll concentrate equally on the challenges, so that going forward we see how we make amends. 
and this issue you raise is one of those things that we'll concentrate on in trying to get it right. And by the way, it's not even underlining illnesses or pregnancies. We have a big challenge, and of course it's something we'll throw or put on the table to discuss with all other stakeholders. You discover that the Saudi guidelines did not stop the aged from performing Hajj. But here you are, you can have 70, 75 old pilgrims embarking on it, and they become a liability. So these are issues, and, and of course, religiously too, you can't stop them. Because so, it is so within their right. Are you, concerned, are you considering imposing age limits? And um, it, it, by the way, is there a spiritual incentive for dying in Saudi Arabia? Because I want to understand why people who know that they are ailing would want to go on pilgrimage. Okay. I, I, I can see the shake, shaking his head. L I won't go deep into it, I don't know, but I'm sure you, you, you'll explain from the scriptures the way it is. That is to, to answer that one. But, you see, put a restriction will be a Herculean task. It's not going to be that easy. Because, like I said, it's within your right as a Muslim to perform the pilgrimage, if you are able to. And uh, it doesn't talk about age. But I think one of the strategies we want to bring to the table is where there are the aged who desire to go, then they should be able to be accompanied by an able-bodied younger people. That, 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 that will assist. But otherwise, in fact, my interest is you to know, I read that most of the problems that were encountered, most of the mortalities or the death that we experienced were not much from the heat wave, mm -hmm. as has been reported. I mean, they were the aged and the sick. All right. Uh, um, Jalal Ahmed Darabi, uh, another comment in, in public domain about this year's Hajj is the fact that those who took part in the Hajj saving scheme uh, were treated specially compared to other pilgrims. Tell us how successful the Hajj Savings Scheme was. Maybe, sorry, before you go to, to that, on the issue of uh, the aged uh, and, and the infirm uh, going to, to Hajj, I think should be, should be addressed. And also the issue of the pregnant uh, women. You know, the, the, the women are in the hijab. You may not be able to discern who is pregnant and who is not. And, uh, Even to, at the point of screening? Well, maybe the a pregnancy of more than seven months. There, there should be. I mean, uh, if women maybe will medical screen, medical screening, but but yeah. but but, but, but for a pilgrim to come and 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 and, and just board a, a flight, you may not you, you may not know. No, the, but 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 uh, Jalal Ahmed has said that there's supposed to be a screening by the states mm. to ascertain their health condition mm. and you know so many other things so at mm. that point yes. 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 Uh, i mean there are lapses of somewhere. course lapses and, you, test, and, and keep, it, keep it at the back of your mind as when well you do your medical screening for women keep it at it? the back of your mind as well women would want to whatever the stage of their pregnancy want to travel to saudi arabia especially to give birth in saudi arabia because that is another pride that this child was born during hajj is in the psyche and maybe the both, both the authorities and the, the and, psyche, and, and, and the scholars anymore. and the scholars should be able to 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 work on that and uh, many would prefer that their aged and their sick would go to saudi arabia and die there why because of the religious importance of the place the reward in religious services and devotions to allah in that place it is not written it is not uh, scriptural it is not textual but you cannot fault somebody who said i want to go there and die but you should be able as an authority to prevent that from happening Happy. because in the religion pilgrimage is mandatory on those who are able to undertake the journey and part of the explanation is that if you are infirm you should be assisted if you are sick Another person can perform the pilgrimage on your behalf. Thank you, Ustaz mm -hmm. Abubakar. But let me get back to Jalala Ahmed Arabi now. I was talking about the Hajj Savings Scheme. I, I want you to tell us how successful that was this year. And uh, reports that uh, those who took part in the Hajj Savings Scheme were treated uh, as first-class pilgrims. Is that true? 
uh, tell us, you know, I wasn't there, so tell us what happened. <laughs> Uh, they, they were treated as pilgrims too, alongside their colleagues. But anyway, that's on a lighter note. Now, the heart saving scheme is a concept that fortunately is enshrined in the NACON Act. I know there were studies, uh, there were seminars, there were retreats before the adaptation. Now, when we came on board in October, we try to dissect the implementation of the heart saving scheme, HSS. Let me say HSS, quantum. Having realized that there were reservations in its implementation from the states and other stakeholders. Now, the idea was to try and inculcate in our people the wisdom in investment, invest for the future and to the future, plan well ahead. There are some clams that have been practicing it for decades. Easy example is Malaysia, Indonesia, and some other countries. But again, going deep into that, it's for another day. Now, after the studies and after the tours and after the retreats, they now felt, look, why won't Nigeria try the HSS? If it comes on board and it is successfully implemented, then it will eradicate most of these fire brigade approaches or last minute arrangements going to hatch. Because once you light onto it, you would have been registered, you would have started depositing your money in the bank until it gets to a point that you've reached the exact threshold of what the heart fair is for that particular year. And then you are detached, you are asked for your preference where you want to fly from. Is it Gombe? Is it Kaduna? Is it Anambra? Is it Edo? Name it. Then such information is communicated to that state's Pilgrim's Welfare Board that, yes, Mr. A has completed his deposit and is ready to be evacuated and then he is flying from there. Like I said, we had discovered that there were reservations in its implementation, especially from the states, because the arrangement that we inherited was Jai's Bank has being the only lead bank that receives the deposits from these intending pilgrims. Mm. And then, since it is purely an Islamic arrangement, the monies are invested in what is halal. And then there's a profit sharing formula between the banks, the depositor, and NACON, NACON and the states. It's almost like a cooperative then? More or less. Now, but then where the problem arose, I think, was the sharing formula. Some were arguing that, look, Jais shouldn't get the higher percentage that they're getting because what they do is just to receive the deposit and they trade with it. But like I said, this is work in progress and we intend discussing amongst ourselves with all stakeholders to see how best we can implement it issue of whether they had gotten preferential treatment. What happened was the states, as far as they were concerned, believed that HSS, though that had invested in HSS, should have followed the same route the pilgrims followed in completing the amount after receipt of the subsidy. But they discovered that the 1.9 million that every other pilgrim had topped up was not collected from the HSS people. And then the response was, yes, it's true, they didn't pay directly. But what the commission did, NACON, was we have a certain percentage too of the profit sharing once the money is mature. We said, okay, for this period, we are going to sacrifice too give our own share, spread it 
across to the uh, to the HSS people. Uh, but but you know, some of these things uh, can get to, uh, to 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 nerves. They can uh, trigger some some emotional response. But uh, in summary, there are not any special from other pilgrims. And I hope by the time we sit down on the table to reassess the implementation of the HSS, we will understand ourselves and then going forward we will do that. But what is critical and what is most important is to appreciate the fact that going forward there has to be something like HSS. Call it whatever name you want to call, but there has to be. We have to encourage people to start planning well ahead. And it's not going to be a look, you go in after a consultation, you go into the theater, no. It's something that you will now have to apply to your psyche. That you stay on a queue, take your time, plan your life, if Allah spares your life, to now start depositing. Knowing that in the next two years or so, it will be your turn to go. That's what most of the clans that are operating HSS are doing. In other words, those pilgrims going to Hajj from Indonesia, Malaysia for the next 10 years know who they are. Once the time comes, you'll be told that, look, it's your time. Get ready. Next year, it's your year. And what they do again, helping those that would have invested, is in the halal way, they try to invest what they deposited, turn it around in the halal way, some of them have gotten estate through that. Some, so many profit-oriented projects have been procured by these deposits to the extent that when it is your turn, for example, to go in 2025 and it is realized that you are just about to cross the threshold of fulfilling or paying for the entire hatch fair, you already have your own dividends from what has been invested on your behalf, they just say, well, of what was invested last year, based on your deposits, you have earned 100 Naira. And of course, you are short by 80 Naira to complete your fare. So if you don't mind, we will take from your 100 Naira dividend, 80 Naira put, and you still have 20 Naira. These are the kind of things that we will all discuss, I mean, as stakeholders understand. Issue of Hajj, Issue of where we find ourselves, I've always told people who are transiting. There are people before us and there are people coming. But what is of joy to you is to make sure that you leave an enduring legacy that yes, you have laid a foundation of something that people coming after you can build on to go. All right. Thank you very much for those comments. Let me get back to Ustaz um, Abubakar Siddiq. You were part, you are an operator, you were part of and parcel of the whole um, Hajj exercise. In what areas do you think that there can be improvements where you found that there were flaws, you know, slacks that can be improved upon going forward to avoid mm -hmm. unnecessary deaths, to avoid, you know, logistic challenges, to avoid people who are not supposed to be, you know, going for Hajj, going there, and one God has, in fact, there were rumors that someone committed suicide um, in Saudi Arabia. I don't know how true that is. In Nigeria. In Nigeria. Maybe the, the chairman will answer that. No, but uh, yeah, I don't what know. are the areas of improvement for you? Let, about suicide, uh, maybe ignorance, I will, I will comment on that. Whether Nigerian or not Nigerian, uh, only an ignorant Muslim. I hope it was because of ignorance, and we hope... Uh, Allah will look at that uh, side of him as a human being uh, and uh, avert the, 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 the punishment of committing suicide on such a, a one. Oh, okay. Ah, okay. 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 okay, I'll leave that. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, in all the years that uh, I have been part of the operations of Hajj, uh, more than two decades, uh, there was no Hajj like uh, Hajj 2024 this hunch uh, especially in the area that uh, Narcon controls most that is the detents uh, about because of the problems I mentioned earlier I was forced to go to the Mashair 
about two weeks before the hunch, trying to find solution with some with some officials from the from the service provider, the Israel Khair uh, people. And to my surprise, the tents in Arafah were ready about two weeks to the time. This has never happened in the history of Hajj. And I think the, the current board of the, of the commission must be commended for that. Uh, I was there. It, it was not that, about three times on three different occasions. I was not, I was not looking for the details. I was trying with the officials to solve the problem at hand. But I saw that the, the, the tents were ready, the carpets were laid, the ACs were functioning. Most of the pilgrims were in Nigeria then. This has never happened. So uh, this should be encouraged, as he has said, whoever is coming should learn from what has been done in, in Hajj 2024, to have all the places ready. Most of the problems in Hajj occur in, in the Mashair, mostly. The, the a tents is where we had a lot of issues. And the air tents issue, as, as I said earlier, was uh, a cocktail of uh, problems, including the service provider itself, that is the Isra al Khair. Uh, to my mind, the, the, the D tents are well managed. And in their wisdom, the Saudi authorities have given licenses to more service providers in Hajj to avoid putting many pilgrims in one company. So the air tents should be removed from the service provider. This was earlier discussed. The chairman has given us permission to, to look for a better option. But <clears throat> we were, as it were, goaded to a spot that brought about dissent. We were not in agreement. And alhamdulillah, now that we have seen what we have seen, even those that insisted that we had to remain with Ithra al Khair, they have seen what we saw when we said, please permit us to leave. Permit us to have a different service provider for the A. If that was not part of Ithra al Khair this year, this would have been the best hunch. But with the, with the, with the, with the problem at, at A tents, that was. Uh, so it's the worst hurt? No, no, not the worst. No, of course. <laughs> I, I, I told you, no board, no board of the commission has achieved the feat of having Arafat ready for the pilgrims about two weeks to Hajj. But, but it wasn't the best. It was supposed to be the best, but for the eight. But for the eight. And so the, 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 the commission can, can, can look at this issue again. Ithra al Khair cannot handle all the pilgrims. Let them handle the detent pilgrims. Let the tour operators be given leave, as he did at the first, to get another service provider who would be responsible for the eight ends. All right. Once we can do that, all these governors uh, sleeping uh, close to laboratories and it wouldn't have uh, happened. All right, thank you, yes. Ustaz uh, Abu Bakr, uh, Saeed Mohammed. Uh, let's get back to Jalal Amadarabi. We're about to go on a break now, but you know, I want to find out from you. Did all the pilgrims return to Nigeria? How many absconded? And, uh, <laughs> and uh, tell us, you know, your reaction to what uh, uh, Ustaz Abu Bakr has said about, you know, the little issue about the D tent and the A tent. What would be your response to that? Okay, um, let, let me start with the last one first now. Um, the, we still have just a pilgrim to account for. And um, uh, coincidentally, he went for Hajj with, with the tour operator. <laughs> and he's in the US now, or in the UK? No, no, no. Or we, 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 <laughs> Where has he been traced no, no, to? No, no, we to find out. Unfortunately, immediately they arrived Makkah from Medina. He was shown to his room. That's the report we received in mm -hmm. writing. Dropped his bag 
and nowhere to be found. Um, we don't want we don't want to foreclose our thoughts on wishing that he's alive because he's aged. Mm -hmm. uh, he doesn't appear or didn't appear sophisticated mm -hmm. to fly to America, but it's um, uh, we, we're still working on it with the with the authorities. But by far, he's the only one when you talk about those absconding. But of course, we have some patients. Uh, currently, we have a few people that are still there. Receiving medical attention? Receiving medical attention. Two of them, unfortunately. Is the mother and baby back in the I country? As you, absolutely. <laughs> I'll, I'll even share, share, share the name of the baby with you. <laughs> so, 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 so they're there. In fact, after the, the completion of the airlift, I had to wait to see if I could still retrieve some of the uh, sick ones. And I, alhamdulillah, I came in with three of them. Who bears the cost of the medical bills? Those who are ill? Of course not come. Okay. Of course not come. But, but for now, in their kindness, those in the hospital, they haven't presented the bill to us yet. Um, so we're waiting to see, probably after they're out of danger, they'll compare notes with us. We do, but, uh, but, but, but for now, uh, not so. We, we can say they, nobody they, has gone to... What's the cause? Are they ill or was it stampede or something mm -mm, I, I think they were ill uh, it's part of what we will look into they All were right. ill because we're not uh, we need uh, to go we need to go on a break okay, now uh, okay. but when we come back we'll talk about some nigerians that did great uh, because we heard a report of a nigerian who found uh, some money and returned it three of them, three of them. okay so we'll talk about that uh, but let's go on this quick break stay with us Welcome back. It's still Good Morning Nigeria, live on the network service of the NTA. And our guests are still very much with us. Uh, we're reviewing the 2024 Hajj. Before we went on that break, uh, Jalal Ahmad Arabi, uh, the chairman and CEO of Nakan, was about telling us about, uh, you know, the great representation, you know, uh, that we got from some Nigerians uh, in the course of the Hajj. While you speak on that, you would also speak to us about those who couldn't make it for this trip. Is NACON planning to refund their monies to them? Or what's the plan? You intend they would be mobilized for 2025 or their monies have uh, gone under uh, the water? If you like, they are still in the pipeline and may never be recovered. <laughs> uh, thank you, Rene. The, it is pleasing to, to say that three patriotic Nigerians made us proud. One from Jigawa, one from Zamfara, and the third one. You were expecting more states. They are Nigerians. I think. I think we should leave it at that. Uh, uh, okay, that's right. Okay, thank you very much. And <laughs> I'll do that. They, they they were so patriotic. They were those that had come forward with what they said they had found, which didn't belong to them. Um, huge sums of money, reasonable quantity. And what we did on the first one, it was so obvious that we could get to the nation where the currency belongs. Because apart from the real, the Saudi currency, there was some Russian currency, the ruble in it. So what we did, we instructed our lesson officer to get to the Russian mission. He did, and they were able to even trust the person, the owner, they did. And we communicated formally and there was an acknowledgement. Uh, the other two, one had some francs. We tried to sample francs and naira. So we said the immediate neighbors that one can uh, ponder on that use naira. It's maybe been in Republic and Niger also. We tried the two who are not that lucky. So what we did, since there's a department for lost but found, within the harem, we wrote formally and they acknowledged that this is what our pilgrims had found out and then we did, we kept. And then the third one too, we couldn't get so we did and then we 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 left it there. You say I didn't have to mention the states, so it's uh, it's quite, what, what was the second question you saw? Those who couldn't make it for the trip but now, uh, <clears throat> some payments. Now, let me tell you how it works. We are regulators, we are not operators. The states normally collect the money of pilgrims 
harvested and then they send it to us and we implement. So a refund are normally gotten from the states, as it were, not from Nikon. But is it possible? Absolutely. Absolutely. One other strategy we came with and which they were in agreement with us is, look, going forward, having experienced what we experienced in 2024, the uncertainties, encourage those that have even deposited, based on trust between yourselves, to make that a deposit for their 2025. But if they desire to be refunded, by all means give them back their money. That is your own call, not ours. And I think some of the states have written back to us that most of those that are unable to complete and are unable to get the subsidy because they came in late have decided to left their monies as deposit for 2025. All right, would you also like to speak? You did say you'll explain uh, later the one who, that committed suicide. Mm. Well, Alleged so. Well, Victor, it's, 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 it's not suicide as such. I mean, it's, it's, it's just unfortunate. Uh, like we've said, without sounding derogatory, um, the truth still remains that 80% of our pilgrims are my people. They are village people. 80%, if not more. Some only have the opportunity of seeing the state capital when they are called to come on board the airplane to Saudi Arabia. That will be the first time they are coming to the state capital. Probably the first time that they are passing through the local government headquarters to come in. So you can imagine. Now, this elderly lady from Kwara was one of those that I've just described. She came in, they arrived to Medina. But then prior to the arrival of pilgrims, there's normally an orientation which we gave to our officials mm -hmm. and insist that they impart it on the pilgrims as they arrive. Um, so they did, and then she went in with, I think, a cousin of hers and a sister. But the arrangement is, once you go in from the lobby of the hotel, rooms were already shared and distributed because we encouraged the pilgrims to go in groups this time around, mm -hmm. and it worked. So group A, of 45 pilgrims, you are going to be on the first floor, you are going to be in rooms 1 to 10, for example. Now, realizing that they were taken to a floor higher than the ground floor, imagine coming in, coming in to the airport in Ilorin, flying to Medina. From Ilorin to Medina, that will be the first experience. Now, she saw the lift and the way it's been operated. And she said, no, she wasn't going to go into the lift. Is there a staircase? And they say, yes, there's one behind. And so you say, ah, okay, you wait for the lift. I'll follow the staircase to go. And she did. By the time she went to her floor, then she realized that she was alone. Others were waiting for the lift and somebody to guide them. Then I think something happened. She now started shouting, where are my sisters? Where are my cousins? They're still downstairs. And then she peeped down and said she decided to just come and join them. Oh, unfortunate. And that was what happened. So unfortunate. That, that was what happened, but it wasn't a suicide. All right. Uh, Jalal Ahmad, uh, thank you uh, so much. Uh, I'll get back to you. But I want to find out from Ustaz Abu Bakr Sadiq Muhammad. Um, at the moment, um, you know, um, there are certain Nigerians who think that, um, you know, the economy could be better who are asking for a protest in government and, you know, key stakeholders have said, well, no, we shouldn't think of that. Some have said that, for example, uh, the subsidy on, on pilgrimage, whether it be Jerusalem or Hajj, whatever, you know, shouldn't be by government. They think that people should, like, like Victor said, should, you know, fund their experiences themselves and all of that. And some have even broken it down to say that uh, the 90 billion, for example, could have assisted like 90,000 startups with a millionaire, you know, which would have boosted the economy. I want you to speak going forward. Would you say that Hajj should be subsidized or like uh, the CEO is saying that, you know, people should think about saving towards it just so they can be able to make the trip irrespective of what the exchange rate is and all of that. I want to hear your, your I, valid I, opinion. I have said it. I think that was the first uh, question. And I think you are trying to bring me back into it again. I said we are Nigerians, and whatever is for Nigerians is uh, 
we are bona fide members uh, that should uh, enjoy that. If the government sees and wants to live up to its uh, responsibilities towards the citizens in whatever situation they find themselves, and uh, something is given for them, they are entitled to it. They are Nigerians. Uh, remember I said, with anything from the government or without it, Hajj is there, Hajj is obligatory, Hajj is mandatory on every Muslim that can undertake the journey. Whether they do or they do not, Hajj will remain and people will travel for Hajj. But I will not uh, take any exception for the government coming in, seeing the problem of its people, the problem of its voters, people who vote you in, and you now say they are in certain straightened situation and you want to help. That is welcome. And every Muslim that is undergoing the, the Hajj or has taken part in the Hajj should have enjoyed, including pilgrims from the tour operators. <laughs> All right. Let's get back to... <laughs> oh, you want to respond? You want to, you want to give your own comments oh, about the subsidy? Oh, oh, or you oh, think oh. that people should save towards it and plan? You could, it could be a 2 years plan, 3 years plan. What do you think? Uh, Sheikh, you, you want to comment because I'm, I'm seeing you... No, I, I, I want to comment on a different <laughs> issue. Th those people bringing money, I, I mean, you are in Saudi Arabia and uh, you have been given $500 as your BTA, and now you discover 2,000 euros, 2,000 dollars, and you are able to bring it back. Allah will reward you uh, for that, uh, because that is not your, your money. If you will commit sin, not in Saudi Arabia. Uh, is there any, anything that the commission, or uh, especially the commission, uh, can do to, as an incentive, uh, thank you very much for this, may Allah reward you. The commission recognizes you for doing this and has given you this. Maybe they have done so. Yeah, so you speak uh, concerning that. Yeah, 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 yes, we have, Sheikh. Um, in fact, we intend visiting the states um, individually uh, to meet with the individuals again in furtherance to what we've already done, uh, as it were. Y you had asked the question of uh, subsidy and going forward investment also. I, I, I think the Sheikh had really touch on it we were in sync with him uh, in that in that regard uh, otherwise i'll be shooting myself down when i was the person that really went cup in hand uh, to get the the assistance and um, uh, part of what he said was what i really narrated because it becomes a responsibility of government to citizens uh, to do that uh, most especially like i said i i, I didn't go alone my other brothers from the other faith too went and uh, and they got a similar thing but what is most important is going forward with the dynamics of time you can not just relax and lay back and wait for government wait for the handout. yes mm. um, if it comes so be it if it doesn't it's good you plan ahead for yourselves and like I said that's what we really want to do in discussing the HSS or whatever name we give it uh, going forward because that is what will endure, uh, not um, a stopgap or an ad hoc arrangement. All right. Uh, and I, I wanted to chip in earlier and say, well, we don't regard her uh, pilgrimage across board as a social service. Then I realized that, well, not everybody benefits from it. So it couldn't be said to be a social service. Mm -hmm. But by the way, tell us about feeding. Um, it appeared that uh, from what people say, that feeding was better this year, but that didn't also stop some people who complained bitterly that they were not uh, well catered for. And we saw some pictures online, by the way. The two akaras or the three akaras. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, beauty of life, the freedom to express. And um, in such a journey where we have to manage over 50,000 individuals with different idiosyncrasies, Certainly, people are bound to talk as they deem fit, and you can't stop them. But uh, like I said, what is most important is having an appraisal of what had transpired. Take the percentage. What were the challenges? What were the complaints? What were the accolades? And then going forward, anybody in a position that we are privileged to be in, to say that you don't 
accept or you don't expect criticisms, then you're living in the past. The beauty of leadership in such a journey is to open yourself to criticisms. Be lucky that they are positive, and that's what we always encourage. There's always room for improvement. That is the beauty of life. Talking about room for improvement, what would you want to see NACON do? I know you're heading the organization. Mm. Uh, you know, what would, would you want to see NACON do as we plan for next year's Hajj? And then intending pilgrims too, what would you want them to start doing now just so that some of the issues that cropped up in this year's Hajj, we don't get to see it again? Plan ahead. Start from today. And that's what we started. Like we said, on the 18th of June, that was when the Saudis formally closed the chapter on 2024 and release the timeline for 2025. That is forward thinking, forward looking, proactiveness, planning ahead. They invited us, they gave us the timeline, which we have duplicated and shared. We will soon reach out to the tour operators uh, when, when we know whether your association is still there or, or we, do, we do with individuals. No, 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 no. <laughs> so, 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 so we did that and where we noticed some lapses, because we looked ourselves at ourselves in the mirror, where we noticed lapses, we had already started engaging with the ministry, especially on issues that the Sheikh had talked about, where they own the sole responsibility and they didn't do well. We now try to tell them that, look, we'll still be coming back to them, but they ought to have done ABC to get it right. We had met with the transport company. We had met with some of the providers, because obviously, what about like they just say. Mm, yeah, just, just, just like I said, we, we, we talked to the ministry about it. Like, you said, like he said, I mean, he had explained. It's not Nakon's responsibility, but Nakon has a duty to ask why was the treatment bad. It is our responsibility. So we did that. And of course, like I said, we'll be asking the tour operators to give us their complaints in writing. We'll be asking some of the pilgrims, some of our leaders that felt slighted, of what happened and other problems, call in your complaints too. And then we will get the provider to, to talk. So collectively we will know and then we will apportion blame where blame should be apportioned, where there will be reprimand, where there will be interdiction, we will do that. But bottom line is, going forward, it has to be right and we have to get it right. In fact, there are some insinuations, some people are saying that Tent A has always been free, that, that it was given to Nakon free and Nakon sold it. No, but no, but that's that, that, that's all right. An individual opinion, but but it's not true. But what we intend doing, like I said, going forward, is to make sure that the right things are done. So you can see that we have commenced in 2025. But bottom line, plan ahead. Let us be like any other organized nation can do. We should be able to because we are good people. We have the potential. We have the brains we can do it so once we do and of course it's not the new mantra okay with, with a general review now not just of this year's Hajj um, you know looking at pilgrims that have gone for Hajj has there been a significant improvement say generally amongst the pilgrims you know in the way they conduct themselves how they you know I mean for example are they more patriotic now because that's what at this point that's what we're calling for patriotism a lot of Nigerians you know have seemed to have lost their faith in the country but has this has this this exercise you know created um, you know a different community of people who are more uh, committed to this country and of course committed to the muslim faith has it you, you, you see it has you see the most important thing is whenever you find yourself in the position that we find ourselves make the pilgrims who are the customers feel important wanted and inclusive give them their rights Give them what is due to them. Communicate. Be open, be sincere. Once you're able to do that, they will understand you. And you see, like I said, Hajj is an entirely difficult project in itself. Conducting it also, you need patience, you need perseverance. So obviously as humans, there are instances when there will be reaction and counteraction. It's human. But once you're able to communicate and do the right thing, they will know that as human, you can err. But certainly, not a deliberate thing to either spite them or to punish them. Once you're able to do that, and there's this point of convergence in trust and understanding, you'll get it right. I mean, I know 
it had happened in the past. But to see people picking something that doesn't belong to them, coming forward as proud Nigerians to give, and then you don't see demonstrations on the street that no, we have not been uh, been conveyed at the time we were to be conveyed, we've not been fed, we've not been, didn't appear. All this boils down to your communication. Make them important. I've always told people that care to listen that look, the Hajj, I mean the pilgrim, should be the king or the queen because they contribute their money, they give you their, their money. clients. It's, absolutely. It's from the money they give you that you operate. Okay. So, so you should defer to them. Let, let's take the last uh, one minute or so to mm. ask uh, Ustaz to give us his concluding remarks, if you like. Mm. What else needs to be done to make um, the exercise better? Intent A, which we control as two operators, change the service provider. Can you source one yourself? The, the chairman has given us permission to do so. So do so. We have done so. We will do it again. Once they ratify it, then that is it. A Nigerian tour operator can operate like any other tour operator in the world. We have not seen anything that they are doing that we cannot do. We will do it and even better to serve our people and to make them feel proud that they are Nigerians and that they are very important to us. Once the service provider is changed, inshallah, the tent A issue will be solved. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Ustaz Abu Bakr Sadiq uh, Muhammad, an Islamic scholar with the National Mosque, a private hard operator and managing director of Comrade Travels and Twas Limited, and of course, uh, the new provider for Tent A. Uh, yes. The new service <laughs> provider for Tent A. Thank you so much. I hope so. <laughs> thank you so if much for, for joining us on the program. <laughs> and of course, uh, Jalal Ahmad Arabi, the uh, chairman CEO, Nakon. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. And when you eventually find that one pilgrim, let us know. <laughs> thank you for having me. I will. <laughs> All right. So that's uh, good morning, Nigeria, this uh, Tuesday. Thank you for watching. I'm Ian Ray John. Live it locked on the NTA. And I'm Victor Azul. I'll see you again tomorrow.